Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay, so you can see them, but they yeah. can't see you. Can you hear me? Yeah. This is John Jameson. Can you hear me? Yeah, John. John, I can hey, hear you. All right. all right. Well, welcome to our uh, Zoom session on butterflies. Um, and I want to remind everyone to mute their mics unless you're asking a question, please. Um, <clears throat> this is a, the, la the, the last in a series of Zoom sessions that we're doing in lieu of being able to get out on the park due, due to COVID. We hope to um, get back out there later this spring, and we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, I'm John Jamison. I'm a, a heritage consultant for the city of Casey, <clears throat> and I manage and plan the park programs for the park and also um, arrange the tours that we have out there. We, ha we have both natural resource and cultural resources. <clears throat> one of the main features, uh, things that, one of the things that attracts people to the park are the cultural resources, which are um, information about the 1718 Fort Congaree, a Civil War battle that we had out there, uh, and also the Civil War earthworks, which are pristinely preserved. Um, all of this is on the National Register. Um, we will hopefully, like I say, be uh, getting back there in the park. In the meantime, I hope we will be continuing some of these Zoom sessions because it, it's, it's allowed us to reach a, a lot wider audience. And uh, we really appreciate everyone tuning in today. Um, the park is located at 1120, or the main entrance at 1120 Fort Congaree Trail, which is right off 12th Street Extension, where it meets I-77. So we hope to see you out there. Um, we're getting into the really nice weather. So hopefully we can, can be, get back in person. And please stay tuned to uh, kc12,000years.com for future programs, both in the park and Zoom. So well, welcome everyone. We are privileged to have um, Marty and Dave Kastner, who are experts in butterflies, and they have spent a lot of time out in the park and in the heritage uh, area, uh, looking and taking photographing, uh, making lists, inventory. They've been a, an invaluable help to us in our. Um, uh, quest for information about natural resources and especially about butterflies. I won't, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to ramble on any, here anymore. Uh, I want to turn, turn it right over to Marty, who's going to be leading the slide discussion, and Dave will be chiming in too. So um, welcome, Marty, and I'll turn it over to you and let you share screen. Thank you, John. Hey, John, real quick. I tried logging in using the same one that Marty did, and it's not letting me in. It says I need to be let in. Okay. So I don't know you're, whether it needs right. to I be. I need to push a button. Okay. You should, it should happen now. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll you check it out. while I was talking. <laughs> no problem. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, keep him, I'll keep on top of that. Okay. Um, I need Dave's help though. Dave, come here. Honey. I, I needed his help to launch it because I'm not. I'm not. Oh, you, which, you do great. You do great. Sorry. Oh, I got it. Thank you. He's he's my help. We we have about um, uh, we have about uh, twenty five participants, so that, that's a good number. <clears throat> and, uh, um, okay. Again. I apologize. I'm I'm new to zooming. We can see it. <laughs> you can see it. Can you yeah, see just, my notes too? Just start the slide. A uh, slide mode. Start the slide mode. There we go. Okay. I think we have it fixed. Sorry about that. Thanks, everybody. I'm really glad that y'all are here and that you're interested. Um, 
I'm going to be using a laser pointer. So that's what I was fixing right there. So there's a lot of uh, magic and beauty with the butterflies in and near the 12,000 year history park. Um, did, did, I've been looking at butterflies probably since 1996. I started to uh, dig up part of our backyard in Florida to plant a butterfly garden. And you know, you never know what, what's gonna come, but, but you're hoping. And Dave and I have had butterfly gardens in Florida, Alabama, and now in South Carolina. But it wasn't until we came to South Carolina and we found the Carolina Butterfly Society around 2006 that we started going out into the field to look for butterflies. Uh, so almost all of the photos in this presentation were taken by Dave. Um, and most of them were taken in or near the 12,000 year history park. So as we go along, just let me know if you have questions. Marty, before you get going too far, yes. for anybody that's joining, um, if you've got window open on the right-hand side of your screen that's blocking part of the presentation, if you go up to the top of that open window, uh, the upper left-hand corner is a bar. Uh, there should be two bars that are highlighted in blue. If you go all the way to the left and sit, click hide thumbnail video, <clears throat> it will get rid of most of it and, and give you a cleaner presentation of the screen. Okay. Okay, so um, this is just a little butterfly basics. So um, butterfly classification, of course, they're animals. They're an invertebrate with no backbone. Arthropod, they have a hard outer skeleton. They're an insect and they're Lepidoptera, which means scaled wing, and that includes butterflies and moths. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, this okay. is more, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so to put things into perspective, there are 17,500 known species of butterflies in the world. There are 160,000 species of moths. There are 750 butterfly species known in the United States, but then there are 11,000 species of moths. So of the 750 butterfly species in the United States, 167 species have been found in South Carolina. And of those 167 species, Dave and I and one other friend have found uh, 50 species so far in and near the 12,000 year history park. And I know there are more species out there that we just have not found them. So we will continue. Um, I know that I said that there were 11,000 species of moths in the United States, but I could not find information about the number of species of moths in South Carolina. Um, and I think part of that is because that is, is ongoing, that people are continuing to research and to, um, to, to find new moths without, throughout South Carolina. So when you go butterflying and you see something flying, you say, is it a butterfly or a moth? Well, uh, the way, general way to tell is that the butterfly antennae are shaped like clubs, kind of like this or they're hooked like this one here. And this is on one of our skippers. They have kind of a, a hooked antennae and they generally fly during the day. Well, actually almost all butterflies that I know fly during the day. And then the moth antennae are either feathered or they are straight. And moths generally fly during the night, but there are moths that do fly during the day. And um, I looked at a little research. I couldn't find any particular reason why moths are at night and butterflies develop during the fly during the day. Um, I know that uh, birds prey upon moths and butterflies and they spend a good part of their day looking for both. And even though the moths are not flying, they could still be found in different places. So butterflies go through a complete metamorphosis, an, an egg to a larva, to a pupa, and then an adult. And th these are all of the uh, stages of the variegated fritillary. 
Uh, the egg was laid on passion vine. And after ha hatching the larva or caterpillar, it'll molt or shed its skin four times. And each stage is called an instar. So when it gets ready to pupate, then the caterpillar will attach itself uh, to either a stick or sometimes it does it to my house. Uh, so it attaches itself to a surface using um, some silk that it's spun. And from there, then it'll shed its skin one last time. And when it sheds its skin that last time, then under that skin is the chrysalis. And the chrysalis will be soft to start with and, and then it will, it will harden. Um, butterflies do not spin cocoons or chrysalises. People often say that, um, that the butterfly has a cocoon, but it does not. That's only a moth that has a cocoon. So if you find a cocoon, there's going to be a moth in there. Uh, chrysalis is, is what butterflies have, what their pupa is instead of a cocoon. So butterflies are dependent on plant communities. The adults lay eggs on specific plants that their caterpillars will eat, and those are called host plants. So they can be trees, shrubs, flowering plants, grasses, or reeds, but they are specific to that particular butterfly. For instance, a certain butterfly will only lay eggs on a plant that it's caterpillars will eat. Um, so many adults drink nectar from flowers and also plants give butterflies shelter from the wind. So in these photos, in the top photo, those are the eggs of Zeruko dusky wing. And we saw the female lay the eggs on this plant, which is big pods, uh, big pod sesbania. And the caterpillar rolls the leaf and then stays inside that leaf shelter unless it's, it comes out for feeding. And I did read that the larva, the caterpillar is going to overwinter in the leaves. So we have been back to look for that, that plant, uh, but we could, not, we could not find it. In the bottom photo, it shows a small skipper that is <clears throat> nectaring on uh, some asters. So throughout the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about host plants, a little bit about nectar plants, but just mm -hmm. remember how dependent um, the butterflies are on, on the plant communities. So some butterflies don't drink nectar from flowers. Some butterflies get minerals from the moist ground, tree sap, rotting fruit, dead animals, scat, and your perspiration. So this top photo, are there's some cloudless sulfurs and some sleepy oranges, and they are all on the ground, wet, moist ground, getting some minerals there. And they call that puddling. This is a red spotted purple, and this is on a dead animal. I don't remember or even know what the animal is. So it's getting some nutrients there. Um, and this photo is a red admiral, and the red admiral is drinking this sap that was leaking from the tree. There are actually nine <clears throat> butterflies on this scat. Um, this was not taken in this particular area, but it just shows you how um, important scat is to some butterflies. And then um, in the picture on the right, this is my uh, recording book where I record where we've been, the date and the butterflies we've seen and, and I keep count of them. And this little butterfly is a snout and he's getting some minerals from probably my sweat that was on my book that I was holding and, and carrying. And you can see we were at the Timmerman Trail that day. <clears throat> So uh, you may see some of these butterflies this spring. These are all swallowtails. Tops are the zebra swallowtails, eastern tiger swallowtail, spicebush swallowtail, and palamede swallowtail. And these are the, the only swallowtails that we have seen within the park. Um, swallowtails overwinter as a chrysalis. So on the warm days, then they're going to eclose as adults 
and the host plant, so the each of them has a different host plant. So the host plant for the zebra swallowtail is pawpaw. And we've seen lots of pawpaws mm. in the general area of the park. The Eastern tiger swallowtails host plants are uh, cherry trees, tulip trees, cottonwoods, and probably others. Um, and we've seen, uh, we've seen many Eastern tigers this spring and we've seen it within the area uh, the zebra swallowtail also. And when we were there just a week ago, we saw our first spice bush swallowtail um, of the year. And the spice bush swallowtail host plants are sassafras and spice bush. In, in my area, in, you know, we live in Blythewood. So in around here, it's, it's sassafras that they use. Um, I, they can use spice bush also, but I have not actually seen that. And for the Palamides swallowtail, their host is Red Bay, which is another tree. So these butterflies you can also see during the spring. Um, this is at the top is the falcate orange tip. And the, the one on the left is a male uh, because he has the orange on the tips. The female does not uh, does not have orange on the tips. It's only only white. Um, and they, the falcate orange tips only have one brood in the spring and its hosts are in the mustard and crucifer family, uh, such as a toothwort or a bitter crest. And um, I have kind of looked in the, in the park and in the area, long, long old state road, but I have not seen any eggs, but, but we have a, a mated pair here that we saw on, uh, or we, we saw that last, last spring. So I'm assuming that, um, that their host plant is within the park. And down here we have the common buckeye. This, this is the dorsal side and this is the ventral side. And on this particular buckeye, uh, this is a rosiform, which is often found in the fall. And on the ventral side, other buckeyes, they can be lighter and they had, could be more tannish in, in color on that underside. And their host plants are Gerardia, plantain, toad flax, and snapdragon. And they will nectar on, on lots of different types of, of flowers. So some butterflies that you see can be easily confused, such as the question mark and the Eastern comma. So the, the question mark has this bar above these three dots, one, two, three dots, and then the bar, okay? Whereas on the Eastern comma, it does not. So if you see the dorsal side, then I always look for that bar to see if it has a bar or if it's missing and to, for me to tell whether it's a comma or a question mark. Then if I only get to see the ventral side, then on the question mark, it has a little, little line and then it has a dot. And that dot makes it a question mark um, and because the Eastern comma has the little line, but it does not have a dot. So if I only get to see the ventral side, then we look for the dot to tell whether it's a comma or a question mark. Uh, the host plants for the question mark are hackberries and elms. And for the Eastern comma, the hosts are nettles and probably elms also. More confusion. So this butterfly called the goatweed leafwing can be confused with, with the question mark and the comma because it has angled wings, kind of like they do. And it's, its flight habitat habit is kind of erratic like theirs is. And there's orange on it. So um, it is, a, this is a butterfly that we leaf wing that was first found uh, near this area by Ron All on September 22nd, 2020. And it was a Lexington County record for this butterfly and only the sixth county in South Carolina where the species has been sighted. Um, so that was a really good find. 
So Dave and I found them. We went to the area where Ron said he'd found it, and we went there in October, um, and we did find uh, the goatweed leaf wing there. Um, so the goatweed leaf wing will overwinter as an adult also. So when we were at the park on March 10th, we were on the Timmerman Trail near the area where um, Old State Road comes in, but we were on the, on the paved trail and we found a goatweed leaf wing there. And it, that's a little bit of a distance from where they were seen last fall. Um, and their host plant was, we have seen it near the area where we saw, saw them last fall. So this, this new one is probably one of those, that same brood because the, as the crow flies, it's probably um, not as far as it seemed when we were walking it. Um, so we're really happy to uh, see that. We're going to, going to continue looking this year to see if this is a breeding colony. Um, we don't know for sure, mm -hmm. but hope so. There's some more butterflies that can be confused. The American lady and the painted lady. The American lady has spots that are connected on, on the bottom of the hind wing. And the painted lady has separate dots on the bottom of the hind wing. Um, the host plants for the American lady are cudweed and pussy toes. And the painted lady host plants include thistles, hollyhock, mallows, and many other. They call the painted lady the a cosmopolitan butterfly because it can um, find a host plant in, in many, many habitats. And it's actually found in many countries throughout the world. Here's the ventral side of the American lady and the painted lady. Sometimes that's the only side we get to see. And the American lady has the two very large eye spots on the underside. So we, we look for those. Where the painted lady has, it has four small spots and you can only see three in there because I think a bird is probably taking a little chunk out of, out of that part of the wing right there. It would be easy to confuse the pearl crescent and the silvery checker spot. On the hind wing of the pearl crescent, we look for these black dots, okay? And we look for them on the, on the silvery checker spot too. The silvery checker spot will almost have at least one black dot that's open and filled with white. So that's how we tell the difference on, on these two butterflies. Also, the silvery checker spot is just very slightly larger than the pearl crescent. Though they look similar, they are not really in the same family. One is a crescent, one is a checker spot. Um, the host plants for the pearl crescent are in the aster family. And for the silvery checker spot, the hosts are usually tall yellow flowered plants, such as wing stem, sunflowers, and yellow crown beard. And um, in some areas in the park, I've found, Dave and I have found a lot of bear's foot, uh, which ha is a plant with tall yellow flowers. And uh, I wonder if it's one of their host plants, but we have not found any, any caterpillars or eggs yet. I'll keep looking. Here's another crescent butterfly. And it's, this is called the seminal breed of the Texan crescent. So the Texan crescent's kind of unmistakable with that dark color and, and then the, the white along the hind wing. And some years this butterfly is found in many sites and in other years it won't, it will be rarely or never seen. So Dave and I have found it in the area along Old State Road in the fall of 2007, 2000, excuse me, 2017, 2018, and 2020. We did not find it in 2019. But in 2020, we found this mated pair. So uh, there is a very good probability that there's a breeding colony. And the host plants 
for these are in the acanthaceae family. I have trouble with that word, sorry about it. And that it has, I don't really know if I looked at the plant, a plant that I would know what its host looked like. It's very, um, there are very many species within that family. So um, we'll keep looking for that also. Here's some more confusing butterflies. On the left is the white checkered skipper and on the right is the tropical checkered skipper. Um, they're very similar. However, the tropical checkered skipper has the large dot side of the hourglass on the forewing. And we call this the hourglass. And if you look to the outside and there's a large dot, it's a tropical checkered sp skipper. Here's the hourglass on here. And if I look to the outside, there's either a small dot or no dot. On the, on the white checkered skipper. Um, the food plants for both of these um, are, are in the mallow family. Sorry about that. Um, so the tropical checkered skipper is mostly a fall species in our area. So we would mostly find it in the fall. Now I didn't talk about the common checkered skipper but the common checkered skipper looks exactly like the white checkered skipper. And for many years, that was the main butterfly in South Carolina. But in recent years, um, the only way to tell the white checkered skipper from the common checkered skipper is through dissection. And some have been collected in many counties in South Carolina and been tested. And they're not common checkered skippers. They are white checkered skippers. So most of our southern and central counties have been test, enough butterflies have been tested that they feel that the white checkered skipper has taken over where the common checkered skipper was. In, a, in your counties further north, they hadn't been tested as much, so you could still find common checkered skippers up there. So depending on which county we're in, when we find that butterfly, we'll either mark it as a white checkered skipper or we'll mark it as a white or common checkered skipper. Here's some butterflies that could be confused, a long-tailed skipper and a Durante's long tail. They both have those beautiful long tails. And the long-tailed skipper has that beautiful blue coloring. That's kind of unmistakable um, with, with the beautiful, beautiful blue. The Durante's long tail has brown on the, on the body. So it is, it, the long-tailed skipper is so uh, often found in the fall and is pretty common in the fall. This Durante's long tail Skipper we found on the 30th of October this past year, in 2020, along Old State Road. And it was a Lexington County record um, and only the seventh county in South Carolina where that butterfly has been sighted. And we think it was probably a stray, meaning that it, it's, there's not a brooding colony here, but we'll continue to, uh, to look. The host plants for both of them are in the legume family. So these are the sulfur butterflies that we're gonna talk about next. And the, this is the cloudless sulfur. And the cloudless sulfur is the largest yellow butterfly that you're gonna see flying in this area. Um, and not the yellow and black tiger swallowtail. I just mean yellow butterflies. Uh, so sometimes it has this greenish tint to it. The female of the cloudless sulfur has pink edged dots on the hindwing and the forewing. The male also has a little tiny pink edged dot there. Um, The cloudless sulfurs um, will increase. You'll see their numbers increase in the late summer and the fall. And their host plants are in the Senna family, including sickle pod and partridge pea. And we actually have seen a cloudless sulfur lay eggs on partridge pea within the park. 
Your two more sulfur butterflies, the sleepy orange and the little yellow. Um, the sleepy orange, you can tell by the, on the ventral side, by this long line. So if you see it landed, it'll almost always land with the wings closed. So you'll see that line on the ventral side. Um, when it's flying, you will see orange and it will be orange with a black border. And so that's pretty um, telling when you're comparing it maybe to the little yellow. The little yellow is smaller and you don't see any orange when it's flying. It has two black dots here near the base of the wing. If it lands with the wings closed and you get a, uh, you know, a good look at it, you can look for those two dots. And then the female will have this kind of rust, rusty patch here. Um, both of these, their host plants are again in the Senna family, especially partridge pea. Yes. Okay. Oh, here's the monarch and the viceroy, which can be confused in flight. Um, so monarchs have been, we've seen them along Old State Road, both in the spring and the fall during migration. Of course, their host plants are in the milkweed family. Uh, we haven't found any milkweed within the park, um, but that doesn't mean it's not there. We just haven't, haven't found it. Um, you can tell the difference between the monarch and the viceroy by this line that goes across the hind wings of the viceroy. The viceroy does not migrate like the monarch does. Instead, it spends the winter as a caterpillar. Host plants, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with, my, with the sun. There we go. Um, So a fish and wildlife document that I looked at, fish and wildlife service document that I looked at from March of this year, talks about the monarch um, butterfly that, that it had the properties to be at risk, threatened or endangered, and it, that that was warranted in every county in South Carolina, but there is no federal protection that exists for that butterfly now. The only other butterfly that I found that was listed as, um, as, as warranted for protection was the frosted elf in, which it, in Georgetown County only. Here's some butterflies that are often found in or near the woods. The left is the Carolina satyr, and on the right is gemmed satyr. The Carolina satyr is recognized by its eye spots near the margins of both hind wings, the hind wing and the forewing, excuse me. And this butterfly will fly low to the ground and we say it just kind of bebops along the path. The gemmed satyr has these beautiful gems on the hind wing and when they're fresh, they look very silvery. And the host plants for both of them are uh, various grasses and the gem stator may also use river oats. Here's some other woodland butterflies, the southern pearly eye and the creole pearly eye. Uh, these butterflies, the southern pearly eye has four spots on the forewing and when you're looking at it they'll almost always land with their wings folded up so what we do is we look at this line right here and we look to see if it's straight or flat, it, which it is on, on the Southern Pearly Eye. On the Creole Pearly Eye, that particular line goes up like this instead of a straight line. And when it does, we say it has knuckles. So if you take your fist and you hold your fist up, it and looks like you've got a finger sticking up there like, like like you have your knuckles. And on, on the Creole pearly eye, there are actually five dots on the forewing. The, this last one is real hard to see because it's partly covered by the hind wing, but it is there. 
Another way to tell them apart also is that the southern pearly eye does have orange antennae. A little hard to see in this particular photo, but, but they do. Here's the red spot in purple. He spends the winter as a caterpillar in a hibernaculum. So in the fall, the butterfly will lay eggs and the caterpillar will hatch and probably the second instar caterpillar will then take a leaf on, this was on a cherry tree, take a leaf and roll it up and it will attach that leaf to the branch with some silk so that when all the other leaves fall off, then the leaf that it's going to spend the winter in, the hibernaculum, that will not fall off. That will still stay attached to the tree. So in February, end of February, beginning of March, then if you look on the cherry trees, you could find <clears throat> the hibernaculum there. You could find then, this is the caterpillar. He's got little horns on him. He'll come out of the hibernaculum and, and feed on the very new tiny little leaves leaves on, on that tree. Um, the red spotted purple can sometimes be confused with some of the black and blue colored swallowtails because of its size, but the red spotted purple does not have tails and it rarely visits flowers. It gets its minerals more from dirt roads and scat and carrion. So these butterflies love to land on you and your equipment to get minerals. This is the Hackberry Emperor. This one has found someone's arm. And this one's on my Carolina Butterfly Society t-shirt. So um, he has, the Hackberry Emperor has blue eye spots on the underside of the hind wing. It also has one large black dot right up here. Uh, this butterfly likes to buzz around your head and check you out before landing on you. Um, the host plant for these are hackberries and sugarberries. And I really feel that within the park, there must be a lot of, a lot of hackberry trees because there are other um, butterflies that use the hackberry or the sugarberry. Um, and we do see a lot of hackberry emperors within the park. Here's the Red Admiral. He likes my, uh, my binoculars. Uh, red Admiral is uh, a very nice uh, butterfly that you can really tell it by these orange bands along the edge of the hind wing and the orange on the top. On the underside, it has this little pink part on the forewing with sort of a mottled black and brown on the hind wing. Their host plants are nettles, especially false nettle. And here's some more. On my binoculars, this is an American snout. You can always tell him by his elongated palps. Palps are mouthpieces. So there, it's the only butterfly that has that elongated um, mouth part there. Um, this, this particular butterfly chose Dave's hat to uh, get some sweat, probably sweat from. Um, they occasionally will nectar on flowers, but we more often see them on the road, on your equipment or your body. And the host plants for the American snout, snout is again hackberries. And the snout is another butterfly that's going to overwinter as a butterfly. So on a warm day, you would be able, you might be able to see them flying about even in the winter. Here's some little ones, little butterflies. Um, this one is Eastern tailed blue and it has these tiny little tails at the base of the hind wing, edge of the hind wing. And it has two orange dots. And we always look for the orange and the, and the tails. Uh, the base color of the ventral side is kind of off white or cream with some black specks. And on the dorsal side of the male and the female, it, it's blue, but you almost always only see that color when it's when it's in flight. The host plants for the eastern tail blue are legumes. And this small butterfly is a gray hair streak. Um, it has slightly longer 
tails and it also has an orange spot with a black dot in it and blue, little blue spot beyond that. And it has this line along the hind wing that's white, black, and sort of a reddish orange color. So the dorsal side of the gray hair streak is also blue. But you can see the orange spot. There's an orange spot on the blue um, dorsal side when, when you get to see that. And they will sometimes open their wings as they're sitting. Mary, I want to say something about the hair streaks. Sure. If you see, if you see the long uh, tails on it, what those tails are is a way for the butterfly to fool birds. The, the, the hair streaks take their wings and rub them up and down, and it makes those hair streaks on the back end look like antenna. So hopefully if a bird comes in, it'll go after the moving tails and let the butterfly fly away. So that's sort of a defense mechanism that almost all hair streaks have. I just so the think that's interesting. Our gray hair streak is the most common hair streak and its host plants are varied, with, but they do include legumes and mallows. And because its host plants are so varied, I did read that, that it had, there were 20 different host plants for it. And I believe that's probably why that, that's our most common hair streak because it has so many different host plants that it can use. Here's another small butterfly, the spring or summer azure. You might get that confused with the eastern tail blue. It's often slightly larger than the eastern tail blue. Um, and it does not have any tails along the edge here. So um, in, our F, in our area, it's difficult to tell the difference between the spring and the summer azure. Um, I don't know any good way in the in the field to tell the difference between the two because they are they are so similar and the summer azure has a spring brood so what you see in the spring might be a spring or summer azure however the spring azure does not have a summer brood so by about june you're not going to see any more spring azures they'd all be summer so when i'm recording I just write Azure species until June. And then after June, it, it's a summer Azure. Uh, the host plants for the summer Azure are a wide, they just have a wide variety of host plants, a lot of legumes. Um, and the spring Azure's host plant supposedly is flowering dogwood. So we talk about a lot of butterflies today, but, and we didn't even include these that are some of the hardest butterflies to identify, uh, the dusky wings and the skippers. Um, I just included some butterflies that could confuse you, but these can confuse you too, but we're not, I'm just gonna tell you what they are, but not really tell you a lot about them. Uh, the first and second pictures are both Horace's dusky wing. This is Zeruko dusky wing. And this, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the individual that laid those orange eggs that I showed you earlier in the presentation. Um, this is a least skipper. He is very tiny. This is silver spotted skipper. This is one of our easiest to identify because of this big silver spot. This is fiery skipper. Ocola skipper and clouded skipper. So we know that there are a lot more, there must be a lot more skippers in, in the area in the fields and things than we had been able to identify so far. So we're gonna keep looking at those. So we talked a lot about host plants along the way, but I didn't mention a whole lot of nectar plants. So there are just numerous nectar plants for butterflies but not all flowers have nectar and not all butterflies choose the same nectar plants. So these are just a few of the nectar plants that we've seen in a near 12,000 year history park. The tall verbena, 
a um, lot of especially hair streaks and uh, skippers and smaller butterflies like that. Bear's foot, bear's foot is this yellow flower right here. Wing stem we've seen, asters and this blue mist, excuse me, blue mist flower or wild azuratum. There's a lot of that in the, in the fall. Uh, we've also seen bone set, blackberry, and ironweed, and many more. And I'm a much better butterfly identifier than I am a plant identifier, but I'm working on it. So there are many more butterflies in addition to the, those that we discussed today. And some of them are smaller, some of them are larger, some of them are more confusing. And identifying them just takes time and practice and a good field guide or website. And butterflying with other people and taking photographs to view on a computer also help when trying to identify butterflies. So to help you identify butterflies better, you could join the Carolina Butterfly Society. Uh, there's membership form on our website. It's just carolinabutterflysociety.org. Um, some of the good field guides that Dave and I use, we use Butterflies Through Binoculars, The East by Jeffrey Glassberg. He's also done a swift guide to butterflies. Um, the reason I like Butterflies Through Binoculars, The East better is that it has only butterflies from the Eastern United States. The swift guide has butterflies from all of North America and Canada. So um, I think, I believe it's, it has a few from Mexico too. Um, so anyway, I, I do refer to that one, but my go-to is the butterflies through binoculars to the east. And another good field guide is the field guide to butterflies of North America, Jim Brock and Ken Kaufman. Okay, go ahead, Mark. One more thing. Uh, butterfly numbers have decreased over the years for many reasons. And some of those reasons are loss of habitat, use of pesticides, and increasing use of invasive plants. So you wonder what, what can you do to help this? If you plant host and nectar plants in your yard, use as many native species as possible, work with other people to protect butterfly habitat, inform your neighbors about planting for butterflies, and don't use pesticides in your garden or yard because the pests you're trying to kill will also kill, um, kill butterflies. So um, if you've been to the 12,000 year history park and along the Timmerman Trail, you've probably seen that the city of Casey has done some logging on Old State Road there. And I talked with Jim Cross Crossland, who is Casey assistant manager. And he said that he had spoken with some butterfly people, he told me, before they logged. And uh, they pointed out some areas to, uh, I guess, to protect. Um, so I talked to him a little bit about maintaining butterfly habitat. And I asked him who the butterfly people were, but he did not know at the time. So at any rate, he's gonna get back with me and let me know. Uh, and some logging is going on further down State Road uh, where Interstate 77 crosses Old State Road there. Um, and I, as far as we can tell, that property is not owned by the city of Casey, but possibly owned by uh, Dominion Energy. So at any rate, we're, we're going to see what happens with that particular area and we're just going to keep an eye on it and I'll keep talking to um, people at, at, at KC City. Um, Mark, we have a request to put the list of field guides. Could you show sure. that slide again? Sure. Okay. Now I just want to say that we are very thankful for the 12,000 year history park because they're not only um, preserving historical, import, historically important areas, but they're also preserving habitat. And, and that's always a, a plus. We have a question, Marty and Dave, in the chat. Uh, is there a reference guide 
that shows butterflies with comparable marks side by side, like you're showing on the screen here with big pictures. <laughs> the, the butterflies through binoculars the East does, but it's not, it, for instance, it's the pearl crescent and the silvery checker spot that I showed you side by side. They're gonna be in different sections because one is a crescent and one is a checker spot. So, so the crescents will be in one section and the checker spots in another. But for instance, when you get to the skippers, all the skippers are in a certain section. So you just have to look at your butterfly that you've found, go through the guide and look at the pictures there and see um, you know, what matches your picture. Do we have any more questions? Um, we have, what are the species that use frog fruit as larval food plant? Or nectar plant? Yes. Uh, the white peacock uses frog fruit. And the Fayon crescent. But we don't get that here. That's right. The Fayon crescent does also. But we don't we get do, Fayon here. Nor, nor the white peacock. I believe we're too far north, but along the coast um, of South Carolina, you will, you will find the frog fruit and you will find both of those butterflies right. further south. Yeah. Is there, a is there a butterfly app? There used to be one that I had. Um, I don't have it now, so I'm not positive. I have not looked into that recently. Well, there's eButterfly also. Well, eButterfly is a site to, record. a place to record your sightings. Well, another good site that we use is um, Jeff Pippin's photographic records. Um, Jeff Pippin is up in North Carolina. He's a phenomenal photographer and he takes some great pictures and then lists them on his website. Um, so that, that to me is, it's one of my go-to places. I think Marty uses it um, mm -hmm. periodically also. So Jeff, P-I-P-P-E-N. So if you search on his name, you'll find it. I think it's Jeff's butterfly page, something like that. More questions? Um, there's some that I can't answer. Um, yeah, I see 17 of them down there. Yeah, there's, People are asking, um, well, one question is, where is the park on the Google map? Um, if, you're, if you're going by um, landmark, if you, if you know where I-77 is and the southern tip of 12th Street Extension in, west, in the western part of Columbia and Casey, uh, the park is just north of there uh, where the Congaree Creek um, runs down and joins the Congaree River. And if you uh, still have a question about that, email me at jhjameson.com, jhjameson.com, yahoo.com, and I can uh, send you, you know, a, a more specific link to the Google location there. Um, when, when we're on 77, we get off at exit two. So if you're on 77, you get off at exit two and go, what is that, west, I would think, yes. to the 12th Street Extension. Yeah, it, 12th Street Extension, I think, runs uh, kind of north-south, but um, uh, depending on what direction you're coming from, you head toward Columbia or, or toward West Columbia. Um, somebody asked how many acres will be timbered. Um, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, you'd have to ask the city uh, uh, Casey, what their plans are. I don't know. Um, what, see, uh, and uh, somebody's asked what apps you recommend. I think you answered that question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> 
is, uh, are, are there cross references to butterflies? Are there um, reference guides that other than what you listed here that people may find in the library or some other source? I'm pretty sure you can, uh, there are lots of other butterfly, uh, I guess identification things that everybody seems to have a butterfly book out, but um, some of them I guess are better than others, but those were just my, my go-to ones. So I don't really have any, any other recommendations. Okay. Um, some people have asked about a recording of this session. I, um, it is being recorded and the best way to do it, uh, it it'll eventually be posted on the 12, on the KC 12,000 um, years.com website. But the, in the short run, the be best way is to send me an email, jhjamison at yahoo.com. And I, I will, uh, not too long after this, I can send you a link to a recording. And people are, are singing praises about your slides, Marty and Dave. Well, thank you. Those are Dave's photographs, so the majority of them. The other ones I didn't take, though. <laughs> uh, somebody said they couldn't use the tennis center address to help find the Tokay Park. Um, uh, it's if you if you go to 1120 Fort Congaree Trail, um, just past the tennis center, which is on your right, as you as you turn off of Trail Street Extension on the Fort Congaree Trail, is the uh, main entrance to the park. There's an orange gate there, and there's some signs there. So again, if you have problems with that, let me know, and I can give you more specific directions. Um, are there any questions that people have that I have missed? I, I'm going to say one more thing. Um, there are butterflies that are mimics of other butterflies. And one of the, uh, the Viceroy and the Monarch, the Monarch uses um, milkweed, which has, it's very untasteful to, butter, or to birds. So birds have learned that orange and black butterflies are not good to eat, so they stay away from them. And the Viceroy is using the same coloration, and so they are mimicking what the, vice, or what the uh, monarch looks like in order to keep from being eaten by birds and other prey. So again, there are other butterflies that are mimics, but the monarch and the Viceroy are probably the uh, most visible, um, you know, most widespread one that, that probably is used. And uh, mimicry is achieved by natural selection, I guess mostly by birds, right? Dave? Yeah, lizards, lizards will eat uh, butterflies too. We've seen that happen. Uh, mostly birds. Marty tells a story about, uh, we have uh, a passion vine in our backyard, which is the host plant for the um, variegated and the Gulf fritillaries. And there was one year that we had probably 150 chrysalises either along the back of the house or the side of the house hanging from the eaves. And um, the Carolina um, wren would sit there and wait just until the butterfly was getting ready to close or come out of the chrysalis and then would fly up and gobble it up and eat it. So, huh. yeah, so the, to me, it's mostly, probably mostly birds that are going after it. In fact, when I take pictures, you can see uh, places where birds have hit the wings of a butterfly, and there's a triangular section of the wing that's been bitten out of the wing, and uh, you know it's a bird. Uh, we, ha we have a, I have a picture of one where there's three bite marks on one butterfly. So, uh, but again, to me, it's, it's probably uh, birds and mostly, mostly birds with lizards and, and um, other things that maybe we'll go. And out. the neighbor's cat. Neighbor's cat, yeah. Yeah. 
laid and wait in my garden one day and grabbed one of my beautiful swallowtails. Uh, um, are there are there varieties of butterflies that are more susceptible to um, predation than others? I mean, I, I'm sure that's the case to a certain extent, and they achieve some protection through mimicry. What are some of the other ways that they uh, avoid predators? Well, the caterpillars themselves, some of them have uh, big fake eye spots on them that make them look like eyes so that if a bird were to look at it, it would look like a snake. And so, mm -hmm. you know, supposedly then the bird, it scared, that scares the bird away. Um, other caterpillars have spines on them, uh, which the birds think would not be uh, too tasteful to eat. Um, as far as the butterflies go, camouflage is a good way to be more hidden, um, especially on the underside of those wings. Some of those very mottled colors and, and, and uh, the veining and all of that is, is just if you had not seen where the butterfly landed, you would not be able to find it. If you had not seen it fly in. <clears throat> Often we'll see a butterfly fly in and see where it lands. And then we have to get the binoculars on it and the camera on it to actually see the butterfly itself because of the good camouflage. So it's Even good coloration too. Hard to see sometimes. Marty, there's well, another question. It says, what butterflies have been found on the Edisto River, upper, lower? Um, I am not actually sure specifically um, along the river. We've been to Edisto a few times. Uh, many of the butterflies that we've seen here might also be in that general area. Um, near the Edisto River um, in Orangeburg County, we've gone to a place called the SI Group, which is a company that makes ibuprofen, but they've set aside 100 acres. They call it their 100 acre woods as uh, they set it aside as, as lands of learning, corporate lands of learning and at its uh, habitat. So uh, along there, there are uh, red admirals and that's the first, one of the first places we saw that goat weed leaf wing. Um, just a lot of the same butterflies that, that we talked about today. Marty, someone's asked a question about butterfly walks. Um, is this something that the Carolina Butterfly Society does routinely? Yes. So the Carolina Butterfly Society is a North Carolina and South Carolina organization, um, a nonprofit organization. And so we will hold usually four walks per year that are full CBS walks. So two in North Carolina, two in South Carolina. We have one coming up in South Carolina. I believe it's April 17th to uh, Francis Marion Forest, State, State Forest. Allison Smith, that I think is, is on here, is, is leading that walk. Um, and you can go on the website and find information about that. Um, and uh, you can sign up to attend that. And then besides that, the Carolina Butterfly Society has chapters. In South Carolina at this time, the only active chapter is the Midlands chapter, which I'm the coordinator of. So in years that are not pandemic years, we hold a uh, planning meeting in usually in January or February, and we plan for the season. At least we try to do one walk per month. Sometimes we'll skip some of the summer months just because they're hot, but but usually not. And we don't always stay in the Midlands area. We've been, uh, you know, over and we've been, we've been further north. So just, uh, just general areas throughout the state. There's also a triad chapter up in the Greensboro, Winston-Salem area. 
that's active. Um, Charlotte. We, we had a low country chapter, which we are attempting to reorganize that right now. So that one may get going in South Carolina. And one in, in the triangle, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area of North Carolina, we're trying to get that one going again also. But at any rate, with the Midlands chapter, um, if you want, if you want to attend one of our walks, you're welcome to attend it as a guest. And then, you know, after that, if you like what you've done, then join the Carolina Butterfly Society. Um, and I would be happy to put you on my email list. And then you would get notifications of when the walks are and when, um, and just, just reminders about that. Um, so this year, being a pandemic year, we have a walk coming up Saturday, and it is over in Chesterfield County. Um, and that is the only one that we have actually planned this year so far, other than we have planned two NAB accounts. NAB is North American Butterfly Association and um, there are accounts that we do at Congaree National Park for them every year. This year, it's usually in June. We've moved it to the end of July because there are more butterflies at that point. And, uh, and then there's one again at Congaree National Park in September. And those dates will be on the website soon. I don't think they're on there yet. Marty, if you... Uh, um want to do these walks in the 12,000 year history park, uh, let me know, you know, in the summer and fall, and I'll either uh, organize it or I'll pass it on to the city, but um, we'd certainly like to host these programs uh, as much as possible. Uh, we have a question that says, will NABA have a count this year? Yes, but there's, they have counts, it's a 15 mile radius circle around a count. So in South Carolina, I know that the counts at Congaree National Park, there's a count usually um, in the Aiken area, but it is done by through the state of Georgia because it's called the Augusta count or the Savannah River count, something along those lines. But there are a couple of areas over in Aiken in South Carolina that are the people count during during that time. Can you um, register, and then can, North Carolina has a lot of different um, different counts that they do also. Can you register for the count? Through if you go on the website, um, once we get the counts on there, then you can register through that. Um, also, there's a, a list serve, which is just a place to uh, where people uh, just identify the butterflies they found. And it's just, um, it's called Carolina Leps. So if you, if you Google that and, um, and you can set it set up to be on that list serve, and then you'll see what butterflies people are seeing, it's both North Carolina and South Carolina, what butterflies people are seeing and where they're seeing it. Um, and, but at any rate, the NAB accounts should be listed on that. I don't have dates for, we don't, we are not aware of dates for some of the uh, North Carolina accounts at this point. Uh, Marty, we have a question. Uh, is, has there been interest among college students in butterfly research, are you aware? Yes, um, at the University of South Carolina, Dr. Carol Boggs has, um, I can't remember her title right now, but she has had students who have done butterfly research. There was one who, who did research at Congaree National Park um, and his conclusion was that um, there are not as many butterflies in June in that area as there are in, in, for instance, July and August. So he suggested moving the count, um, which we have done for this year. 
Uh, so just re research that way. Is is there a butterfly walk this weekend? Yes, April 3rd, 9.30, we meet at Carolina Sandhills National Wildlife Refuge parking lot on Highway 1. And this information is on the Carolina Butterfly Society website. Um, we, Dave and I went scouting yesterday because the plan is to meet there and then drive 30 minutes to an area of Chira State Park where we found brown elfins, Henry Elf, Henry's elfins, Hessel's hair streak that we did not find Hessel's yesterday. Um, so we were going to go there and then we backtracked or went back towards the uh, Carolina Sandhills National Wildlife Refuge, and we stopped at uh, Sandhills State Forest and where Sugarloaf Mountain is, but we had a tip to go to Horseshoe Mountain. So we did go up there and look and found some other butterflies. And then uh, the plan was to be back at Carolina Sandhills National Wildlife Refuge about 12 or 1, and then just, we you have to, to take a group there, you have to have um, a permit. So I applied for the permit. And when I got the permit, it said that we could go along Wildlife Drive and on either side of Wildlife Drive looking, um, but not other areas because they're having a turkey hunt that day. So when Dave and I scouted that yesterday, that area up near the, the, the closer to the road, they burned a lot of it, controlled burns. And so the plants that we are looking for are not there. And as we drove further down Wildlife Drive, we did not see any nectar plants whatsoever. So we have decided that, that we are not going to take the group to the Carolina Sand Hills because we're limited in where we can go and, and because of the areas that are burned, there's no nectar there and there were no butterflies, so. Um, should, so. should people expect uh, bugs, mosquitoes, so forth this weekend? As we were going yesterday, there I did not get mosquitoes, but there were some little gnat kind of things flying by me at one of the areas, and but. Since, and since we are in grass area, I uh, recommend spraying up on your legs or tucking pants in because there are ticks out right now. And the area, the two areas where we're going, the, the first area where we're going, the ground is uneven. Um, so you just have to kind of watch where you're going. It's not a trail. This, the second area, in order to get to where the butterflies that we saw were, it's, uh, it's up near the top of Horseshoe Mountain, so you have to uh, take their little their little steps up. wasn't too bad. I think I don't remember how many feet up, but it wasn't wasn't too bad. Well, one 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 way said sixty five feet, and I estimate the opposite side was about thirty feet. So, so so wear um, walking shoes. Um, absolutely. And bring water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Water, lunch you know, or snacks or, or whatever. Um, and as far as bathrooms go, there is a bathroom at, at uh, near uh, Horseshoe Mountain, but there is not a bathroom near the first place or the meeting place. So you just have to kind of plan accordingly for that. Sturdy shoes are, are definitely needed. Do these last uh, a couple of hours, typically? They'll often last all day. <laughs> okay. So we, Dave and I probably will leave to come home by about three. All right. On that day. This is Allison. You might want to mention what equipment people might want to bring along to make the outing most enjoyable where they can see the most. Sounds good. So if you have binoculars, they definitely are helpful. Close, um, close, if you have close focus binoculars, bring them. Right. If you and if you have your uh, camera, I would I would take 
pictures also, because when you get home, you sometimes found that what you thought was one butterfly might be a different one. And also then you have a record of something that you can compare it with. Um, so, so you'll want, you know, binoculars, camera, you know, whatever clothing you feel you're gonna need for the temperature because um, it is not supposed to be all that warm on Saturday. Last time I looked, high 63, but that's what it was supposed to be yesterday. And it was sunny. When we got to the first spot, it was 55 degrees. We got out of the car and an Eastern Niger swallowtail flew by. So things were out, but they're more out in the, in the sunny areas. So uh, in, in those kinds of temperatures. Um, definitely, like John said, water and snacks are, are important. Okay, any, any other questions? Well, I want to thank so much Marty and Dave. Uh, obviously, you're tremendously dedicated to this topic, and we are indebted to you for all the information you've brought today. And obviously, you are a wealth of uh, information um, that we could probably talk all day about different varieties of butterflies and some of the um, threats they have, but uh, thanks so much. We are uh, hopefully going to be continuing to do these Zoom sessions. So take, stay tuned to 12,000years.com, kc12,000years.com for future programs, or um, um, you might want to just email me at jhjamison at yahoo.com and I can update you on that. And also I'll give you links to the recordings that uh, we're gonna be eventually posted on the website, but in the short term, I could give you uh, links that you could follow to look at this presentation, as well as the, I think, 18 others that we've done on natural and cultural resources at the 12,000 year history park. Um, thank you so much. We, um, one thing for me, I was a <clears throat> biology major. I ended up being an archeologist, but I was a biology major in college. so. I'm very much interested in, in the natural resources. And as Marty and David pointed out, uh, this is something we, we have an opportunity to see and enjoy in the 12,000 year park and other places it's right in our backyard. So uh, we, hope, we hope to see you out in the park and uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, I guess we'll close it. Marty, if you have, Marty and Dave, you have any, any closing comments? No other comments. I just thank everybody for for attending, and uh, we hope that we'll be able to see you on one of the walks before too long. Okay, we will. Okay. We will end it there. Thanks, everyone. Thank uh, you. Thank you, John. Thank you for Take care and stay safe. Bye bye. Bye.